right, we've been talking about um, who's your one. And uh, we'll keep talking about that um, through oh, probably another week or two. Anyway, if we're gonna if we're gonna reach people with the message of um, Christ, the saving um, grace of Jesus, all of us are gonna have to work together um, in order to do that. It's gonna take um, it's gonna take a lot of us. And the, the Great Commission, when it says for us to go into all the world, um, you probably have heard somebody say this before, but that beginning part where it says to go. What it actually says is, as you are going, um, one of the translations I read this week says, having gone, then make disciples. And so it's supposed to be as we go. So it's not really a command that you were doing nothing at all, but now I'm commanding you that you ought to go. It is, you're already going. You're going about your regular life. As you are going, you've got to make disciples. And how are you going to do that? Well, you've got to invite people to find out who um, Jesus is. And so the problem is we're not doing enough of that. So um, I'm gonna make you participate with me in, a, uh, in an example. Um, so let's have everybody in this section over here stand up. Three, four, five, six, seven, that's eight of you. Um, everybody over here stand up. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, that's exactly right. Okay, so I don't know how they did that. So. Here's what the statistics say right now. If everybody in here, we got about 100 people in here. If everybody in here was a Christian, only 20%, only about 20 people out of all of us would invite another Christian, another churchgoer, another religious person to come to church or to talk about God or to talk about Jesus. Only about 20% would invite another religious person. That means you meet somebody new that's coming into the community and they've moved in next door to you, you get to talk to them, and they say, listen, I went to church when I lived up on the north side of Atlanta. Can you tell me about a church you go? Only 20% of the people would say, I know a church you can go to. Okay, all right, sit down. <laughs> so, so that's part of the problem. Here's the other part. Um, Sherry, you wanted to stand up last week, so stand up. Um, Karen, stand up. Okay, so we have two people coming, so stand up. So only 2%, if all of us, we've got 100 people in here, only 2% of the people would ever invite a non-Christian, a non-church-going person, a non-religious person. Only 2% would invite somebody who doesn't have anything to do with church to come to church or to know who Jesus is. Okay, you guys can sit down. So, can you see what the problem is? Yeah, yeah we're, we're losing the battle because we're not even in the battle. We're not making any effort at all. When, when, I mean, the 20, I mean, it was good that 20% that would try to invite, but the people that they're inviting are probably people that are already believers. The, the ones we need to invite to Jesus are the ones that, that don't know who he is. Uh, maybe they've heard his name, maybe they use his name, not in a good way, but, but they don't really know who he is. And so we've got to, we've got to do a better job of that. So that's what, that's what I'm trying to talk to you about when we're talking about who's, who is your one, who's your one. So we're in John. Uh, chapter 1 this week. Again, we're sticking in the New Testament, so it's uh, um, easier to find them when we were in Jonah um, each week. Um, today we're going to look at four people, four more people. I'll talk to you about some that came to follow Christ as disciples last week. We're going to look at four more um, people this week, and um, we're going to meet these four guys, and, and it's going to be really quick. It's going to be kind of like speed dating. You didn't think I knew what that was, did you? <laughs> um, I don't really know what it is, but I read it someplace. So, I mean, this is going to be, it's going to be uh, pretty quick as we go through this. So we're in John chapter 1. We're in verse 35, and we're going to go to the end of the chapter, but I'm just going to read a few verses at a time, and then we'll talk about some of these guys that he's um, calling here. John uh, chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 35, and I'll read the next few verses. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him and uh, heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and then followed him. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. 
So the first one of the people that I want you to see today is Andrew. Andrew was an enthusiastic witness. Not everybody is enthusiastic. Doesn't mean that you're not a witness at all, but Andrew was an enthusiastic um, witness. The, the setting of this is in a, a Judean wilderness, and uh, John the Baptist is preaching and baptizing, and he has people that have followed him already, so they're his disciples. Uh, I told you last week that that's what these um, young men would do. They would study the scriptures, and then they would find a rabbi, um, a teacher, to follow. And so some of them are already following John. And when John says, look, here is the one that I've been telling you about, then Andrew is one of the ones who, we, we don't know what all went on, but he followed him. We don't know what all he said, but he, he followed him. Two of them took off um, after him. All we know is that after Andrew listened to Jesus for a little while, it was four in the afternoon, it appears to be fairly quickly, if not later that day, by the next day, he had heard enough. And so he goes and tells his brother, Simon, about Jesus. And the confession that Andrew um, makes in this is, he says to him, we have found the Messiah. Every Jew in Israel was looking for the Messiah at this time. Um, Something that Jesus said convinced Andrew, this is the one. This is the one that you're, uh, that we're looking for. And so I, that's why I call Andrew the enthusiastic um, witness, because he is um, enthusiastically looking for this Messiah that is um, coming. Andrew, uh, we know that he does several things that are um, enthusiastic, but one of the first things he does is he finds his brother, Simon, and he tells him, come, we found, um, we found the one that um, we've been looking for. Um, when we get over into John chapter 6, we read um, about the, the feeding of the 5,000. You know who brought the little boy to Jesus? Andrew. He's the one that was, he's always bringing people to Jesus. We don't read anywhere at all where Andrew ever preached a sermon. But we read lots of times. Every time we turn around, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. So what you and I ought to be involved in is Operation Andrew, bringing people to Jesus, as many people as we can to meet Jesus. The application here is Jesus is the one that you're searching for. Jesus is uh, the end of your search for meeting, for meeting. Jesus asked Andrew, here's what he said to him, what are you looking for? We don't have down that Andrew gave him an answer, at least they, they didn't record it. But after spending just a few hours with him, then he goes running to find his brother Simon, and he said, I found him, I found the Messiah. He had found what he was looking for. I met a lady named uh, June um, several years ago. Somebody told me about her, and uh, they didn't ask me to go see her. They just um, told me about her. I, it, was, it was her daughter um, that told me about her. Uh, June is probably uh, 70 years old, and uh, I just felt like I needed to visit her, so I went to go um, see her. And uh, by her own admission, I had already heard a little bit about, about this, but by her own admission, she said uh, she had been um, pretty crazy in growing up. She had been in and out of a number of relationships. She had traveled the country, and, and uh, as we talked a little bit, um, she told me where all she had been. And she told me about other countries she'd been in. Uh, she told me some about some of the relationships she had been in. And I said, so was it was it as much fun as you thought it would be? She said, no. She said, it really didn't bring any joy into my life. And she would tell me more about things that, that she had done. And, and she said, it's just, it's really just been a, a miserable life. And I said, well, what were you looking for? And she said, I, I, I was looking for joy and happiness and contentment in life. And all the stuff that I kept searching for just left me feeling empty. And I said, you have any kind of spiritual beliefs? She said, yeah. And she told me some of the craziest stuff. <laughs> She's just making up stuff. Uh, she, she told me about stuff. And, and I said, how is all that worked out for you? She said, still not any joy or happiness. I said, I can tell you why. She said, why? I said, because you find joy and happiness by having a relationship with Christ, with God, the one who created you. That, that's where you find joy and happiness. And she said, how do you get that? I didn't say this out loud, but in my mind I said, I'm glad you asked. And so I told her about what you do to have a relationship with Christ. I said, you, you've told me some things about you, but I already knew a few things because the Bible says all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. I like asking people this next question. I oftentimes say, it says all. Do you think I have done things that are opposed to God? Kids usually pretty quickly say, yeah, they think I have. A lot of times adults think maybe because I'm, I'm a minister that I haven't. <laughs> and so they sometimes stumble at that. So she was stumbling. And I said, listen, it says all. All have sinned. I have sinned. I know you have sinned. Before you told me all the stuff that you have done, that you said has been miserable, and, and stuff that you know is not right for people not to do. She'd been a, a hard, she lived a hard life. Um, she knew she had mistreated people, and used people, and abused people. I said, all have sinned. But the Bible says that Jesus came and died to pay the price for your sin and for mine. And she said, how do I get that? People ask the craziest questions if you just invite them to come uh, to Jesus. I shared with her what you do. She asked me, she asked me, could she pray and do that right then, or did she have to wait till she could get to a church? <laughs> she had to get to a church. You, you can do it right now. So she prayed with me, and, and she found what she was looking for. Jesus asked Andrew, what are you looking for? Um, and so uh, that's the same question he continues to ask um, you and I today. I think it's one of, it's interesting. That's the first recorded words that we have um, of Jesus in this book of John. What are you looking for? Um, Everybody, everybody has a, a hole, H-O-L-E, a hole in their soul. And the only thing that will fill it is God. The only thing that will fill it is, is Jesus. And lots of people that are searching, just like June was, they keep trying to put stuff in there. Um, it is all kinds of things. It's, it's money, it's fame, it's um, uh, possessions. But nothing will fill that um, void. It's like when you try to put a round peg in a square hole. You know, a round peg will fit in a square hole. If the peg is small enough, it'll fit in a square hole. It won't fill it up. It leaves gaps at the corners. So it doesn't really fill it. It goes in there and leaves, it leaves some to be desired. I think it was um, a theologian, Pascal, who first said, we have a God-shaped void and the only thing that will fill it is God. Because that's the shape that it is. And then we try to put stuff in that um, hole. It's drugs or alcohol, it's houses, it's cars, it's hobbies, it's, it's stuff. And it just doesn't last. The only thing that will fill that God-shaped void is when you put God in it. Amen. And so like Andrew, I have, and many of you have found the one thing that will satisfy your soul, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Continue on in a passage that we're reading. Verse 42 says, and he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Simon, his, his real name is Simon, son of John. We would have called him Simon. John's son, and we probably would have said it that quick, so it would have been Simon Johnson. Um, but when Jesus met him, he gave him a nickname. He gave him a nickname of Rock, so we would have called his nickname Rocky. And so this is who this is. His name means listener, and Simon really was a, a, a listener. He listened to everything that everybody else um, said. If you look through the four gospel accounts, you will find he is wishy-washy. He repeats what he's heard from different um, people. He is always saying the wrong thing. He occasionally stops long enough and opens his mouth to change feet. I mean, he was always saying the wrong stuff. When we fast forward ahead three years from this point right here where he is beginning to follow um, Jesus, um, it's the night before his crucifixion, Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus is telling them that all of the disciples would desert him. And you remember what Peter said. Oh, the rest of them may desert you, but I, I will die for you. I will not desert you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times. And then you know what happens next. He is standing around and he hears all the accusations of the servants in the courtyard of the high priest and somebody says you were with him no I, I wasn't I wasn't with him and then uh, another person says 
You know, I can tell by the way you're talk. You're talking. You're just a country boy from Galilee. You, you are one of them. No, I am not. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not one of them. And then a servant girl says, I am certain you are one of the disciples. And if you look at the scripture, it says, then he cussed like a sailor. He did. He said, I'll be blankety blank cursed if I was one of them. I'm not one of them. And then if you wait for it, you can hear the cock a doodle do as the rooster crows. That's who Peter was. But his confession a little later says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So what is it that convinced Peter? When you continue reading through the gospel accounts, then you learn that it took several months and a number of miracles and a lot of messages before Peter finally came, uh, became convinced. He was different than Andrew. Andrew just had to hear a little bit, and he was ready to follow him. Peter, it took him a while. There are people in here, you and me, that are like Peter. You've heard the message, and, and maybe you've considered some of it, but you're not ready to confess that he really is the Son of God. So what do you do? You just keep watching and listening and um, waiting for God to speak directly to you. And at some point, you will come to a point of belief. I think the application for us here is that Jesus sees your amazing potential. Um, when he first met Simon, he could see that Simon was a rock. It took a long time for the listener to become a leader, but eventually it happened. The cowardly fisherman that denied Jesus three times becomes a courageous preacher on the day of Pentecost, and he stands up and he proclaims the truth, the good news of who Jesus is. Um, this same rock stood before the Sanhedrin, the same Sanhedrin that had condemned Jesus and said to them, you killed the Son of God. He was uh, the one that after he said that they beat him and told him, you can go now, but stop talking about Jesus. And he said, I will have to obey God rather than man. Like a rock, he preached to tens of thousands of people. And tradition says, eventually he was arrested and he was crucified. Jesus saw this listener, Simon, and he knew that he would become a leader, Rocky. And he looks at you and me, and today he sees your spiritual potential and my spiritual potential. He sees men and women and boys and girls who can become champions for Christ. You may think that you don't have all that it takes, the, the skills or the abilities to do what God has called you to do. But I will tell you, he will shape and mold you into whatever he has called you to be. That's what he will do. Verse 43 says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, and he found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, Philip answered. Philip. Philip is one that is really a, a thinker, and he's one that Jesus sought out. One of the things that we learn about um, Philip, um, in the Greek, his name means lover of horses. Philip II was the father of Alexander the Great. Philip might have been from Greece or Macedonia. Um, one of the interesting things that we learn about Philip, um, Philip, uh, Andrew, sought out Jesus and brought his brother Simon to him. But Jesus traveled all the way back from Judea, back to Galilee, searching for a particular man, Philip. That's who he went back um, to get. He lived in the same town as Peter and Andrew. But Jesus went back to seek him out. Besides this passage, there are um, other occasions that we learn something about Philip. In John chapter 6, I told you a minute ago about uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and how Andrew brought um, the boy to him. When uh, Jesus spoke to Philip at that um, feeding of the 5,000, he said to Philip, where can we buy food to feed all of these without missing a beat? 
Philip answered and said, it would take over 200 denarii to feed this kind of crowd. It just shows that Philip is a, a thinker. He's pondering what all it would take. He could look at a crowd and tell almost immediately how much money it's going to cost to feed this kind of a, a group here. Philip's confession, he says, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. So when you see what he told Nathan here, we can see his faith is still incomplete at this time. He doesn't fully understand who Jesus is at this point because Philip calls him Jesus, the son of Joseph. You and I know that it is Jesus, the son of God. And so he's still working on deciding exactly who he is. Philip is a, a thinker, but it took him a long time to fully understand the identity of who Jesus was, that he was God's son. In John chapter 14, Jesus was talking about his father, God. And Philip says, Lord, just show us the father and that will be enough. And Jesus said, Philip, I've been with you all this time and you haven't figured out in your brilliant mind when you see me, you have seen the Father. It took Philip a, a while, but he did finally get it. The application we would take away from this part here is Jesus is looking for all kinds of people to follow him. That's good news for you and me. If you look around in here, all kinds of different people in here. That's exactly what Jesus is looking for. Philip was an introspective kind of thinker and was probably often overlooked. We probably would have called him a geek if we had seen him today. But Jesus went searching for him so that he could find him. Jesus is looking for anybody who is willing to admit that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. You don't have to be good. You don't have to get it figured out before you come to him. The, the song that we oftentimes sing, uh, just as I am, yeah. I come. And that's how he wants us to come to him. Jesus told us that God is like a shepherd who had a, a, a hundred sheep and one lamb wandered off. And he went looking for that one lamb, left the 99 to find that one so that he could bring him and carry him back safely in his arms back to the flock. Now, if we have a hundred people in here today um, and all but one already knows the Lord, Jesus is looking for you if you haven't trusted in Him yet. And so I pray that, that the Holy Spirit of God would, would touch you and surround you and encompass you and help you to understand Amen. who it is that is seeking after you because He's looking for you. Amen. Pick it up in verse 47. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards Him and He said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus answered, uh, Jesus answered him, Rabbi, Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the man of God. Nathaniel, he is a, he's an honest seeker, open to be amazed. His, his name means gift of God. And the very first question that Nathaniel asks when he sees Jesus is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel, Nathaniel was, was from Cana and if we get over a little bit farther, back to the next chapter in John, that's where Jesus turned the water into wine. Today, Nazareth is a really large city, and Cana is a tiny village. But back in this day, it was the exact opposite. Cana was a really large city, and Nazareth was just a, a little speck of a town, a sleepy little village. And so Nathaniel was astonished that the Messiah could possibly come from Nazareth, such a, a small place. I can remember, some of you can remember back much farther um, than me, but I can remember a time when I um, first moved uh, to Locust Grove, when I would watch the, uh, the news from Atlanta on the map, there was Atlanta, and then the next town down was Macon. 
That's all that was, was there. And then eventually, more and more traffic um, was coming um, south. And so then, finally, they would get McDonough or McDonough, if you don't have any idea how to pronounce where we live. Um, finally, McDonough got on the map. Now, Locust Grove um, is on the map. And when I see the weather map, it is um, located down there because we have um, gotten um, big enough. There are enough people that are uh, down here that they're giving us um, the weather that is here. Nathaniel, he was, he was honest. He was a straight shooter. And when he met Jesus, he made, uh, Jesus made an, uh, an amazing observation. He said, here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile or deceit. And that's, that really is a play on words um, when Jesus is saying this to him. Jacob was a, a grabber, a deceiver, and uh, his name was changed to Israel. And so when Jesus sees um, the honesty that is in Nathaniel, and he says to him, wow, this is what he's really saying, wow, an Israelite, somebody from Israel, an Israelite with whom I, in whom I see no Jacob. So it really was kind of a play on words when he said um, that he was one with no deceit coming out of the town that he was from. Nathaniel is astonished that this stranger would know these kinds of things about him. And he asked, how do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. Now, I don't know if he actually saw him or if it was a vision. Whatever is going on is a miracle here because he's, um, he's seeing really into the heart of who Nathaniel is. He saw into his character and he knew that uh, he knew his heart, Nathaniel's, just like he knows your heart and my heart. Nathaniel confessed. He said, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. This is the most powerful of these four men. This is the most powerful confession yet. He's not just the Messiah. He's not just a, a prophet or the son of Joseph. Nathaniel declares Jesus. He is the son of God, the king of Israel. He was amazed that Jesus knew him so well. The application for us is Jesus knows you and he still loves you. He knows you and me and he still loves us. Jesus saw Nathaniel. He knew his name and he knew his heart. But Jesus says to Nathaniel, you haven't seen anything yet. Just, just wait. Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the man of God. And, and he says, truly I will tell you. And really that, that when he says, truly I will tell you, he's just saying, pay close attention here. What I'm about to say is really strong. It's supernatural and true. Um, so that is, that is Nathaniel. And so each one of these, um, Jesus, when, when he told Nathaniel, you will see heaven opened up and the angels ascending and descending. He's referring to a passage back in Genesis 28 where Jacob had a dream and he sees this stairway that reaches to heaven and the angels are going up and down on this um, um, stairway. Jesus makes this amazing claim to Nathaniel. He said, unlike Jacob's dream, those an angels aren't ascending and descending on a ladder. They're ascending and descending on me, on the Son of God. And really what he's saying is, I am, I am the passage. I am the stairway to heaven. I am the way to heaven. No one will come to the Father except through me. Some people are uh, trying to take a, uh, an express elevator or escalator um, to heaven. They're, they're trying to be good enough, trying to do enough things. There's not another way to get to heaven. It is all Jesus is the staircase that gets us to to heaven. So these are all different um, people. And and I'm in a different place than you, and you're in a different place than me. Um, people will come to Jesus if we invite them to Jesus. And we can invite them to church, and, and that is good. But, but it's more than inviting them to church. It's inviting them to Jesus. If one of the ways to do that is inviting the church, then that would be good. And so do that. But invite them uh, to Jesus. I got, I got several invitations um, this week. Some of them were on paper. They were advertisements for some restaurants with some really good coupons um, to go out to eat. I didn't pay attention to any of those. But I got one invitation this week 
to go eat breakfast. So I went and ate breakfast. And we talked, and so it was church, but um, it wasn't um, blatantly about church. We got done eating, and when we got to the cash register to pay um, before we left, the lady at the cash register said, so what time does your service start? I don't know how, I don't know how she had any idea what we were even talking about. What time does your service start? If you will listen, if you will listen, there are people that are asking you um, for information about Jesus. And it may sound like information about church, but they're asking you um, for information about how to know. There, there are places, there are people that we can, uh, that we can talk to. A lady was in the um, hospital within the last um, week or two, and um, she was um, uh, no energy, she was lethargic. When she got to the, to the hospital, the doctor ran some tests, and the doctor determined that she, uh, that she was dehydrated. You know what that means? So, so, so she, was, um, she didn't have fluids, she needed to get fluids. So that's when you get sick, you just don't like eating and drinking, and so you don't, and, and you, you, you get dehydrated. Now think about this, so the doctor knew what was wrong with her. She was dehydrated. So what if the doctor's plan had been, get a few of the nurses together, everybody get a cup of coffee, and let's go in and stand around her bed and drink coffee, see if she can figure out what the problem is. Well, if that's what your doctor does, you need to get a different doctor. <laughs> what she needed was fluids. So you know what the doctor did? He gave her fluids. You and I have people that need to know about Jesus. And, and some of them don't know that's what they need. This patient didn't know they were dehydrated, but that's what was wrong. You and I are around people every day that need to know about Jesus. They need you to tell them about Jesus. Now, they need you to invite them to church, but more than that, they need you to tell them about Jesus. A lady came into my office on one day, this has been several years ago, but she came into my office and she said, how do I join your church? And I said, uh, well, where are you a church member now? And she told me, and we talked for a few minutes, and um, she told me about the church, and I said, is that when you became a Christian? And she said, no, and let me tell you, if she had told me yes, then I'm trying to have a conversation with her. One of my next questions would have been, so what happened when you became a Christian? So I, I really would have wanted to know. But I said, is that when you became a Christian? She said, no, and she told me about another church. And when she got done, I said, is that when you became a Christian? She said, no, and she told me about a third church. I'm not making this up. She told me about a third church. I said, is that when you became a Christian? She said, no, so I quit asking her. I said, listen, let me tell you something. When I was nine years old, I had been in church all my life. When I was nine years old, I realized, I can remember where I was sitting. I was in Bethel Baptist Church in Stockton, California. I was sitting with Joy Melton. I don't know if I could pick out Joy Melton. I just know her name, but my mom was playing the piano. And believe it or not, I wouldn't just sit on the row and be good, so I had to sit with somebody. So I was sitting with Joy Melton. I know you find it hard to believe. I was sitting with Joy Melton. I know which side, there was a center section. I can tell you I was about four or five rows from the back, and I was on the end. I, got, I, I don't know if the church is still there, but I can find where I was. I, I remember thinking during the service, I've been in church. I knew, I've heard those stories. Jesus, all of us are sinners. Everybody, that Jesus came and he died. I believed all of that. He came and he died on a cross to pay the price for people's sins. Something, something uh, happened in that service. And it wasn't during the service, it was more at the end of the service. But I realized that it wasn't people that had sinned, it was me. And it wasn't that Jesus died for people's sins. He died for my sin. And that if I wanted to spend eternity with him, and I wanted um, him to give guidance in my life, I was only nine years old. I understand it a lot better today than I did then. But at nine years old, I realized it was me that he died for. And so I trusted in him. And so I told her about that. When I told her about that, I said, is there been a time when you've done that? She said, no, I haven't ever done that. She'd been a member at three churches. But apparently nobody had ever asked her if she was trusting in Christ. She was just one person, but she was one. I met a man in the uh, hospital. I didn't really know him. Somebody asked me to, uh, to pray for him. They did not ask me to go see him. Um, but I, I went to go see him. There was just something as I prayed um, for him that I really felt um, burdened about him. I, I didn't know his story, and I'm really glad I didn't know his story because after he told me some of his story, it really would have scared me. And I probably would have been reluctant at the very best to go um, see him. He had ministers in his family. He had people that had uh, talked to him and had told him about Jesus. Um, he told me later that he kicked some of them um, out of his um, house. 
I don't know how come he would listen to me, um, but he did. I knew that his time was short. I didn't know how short. But when I talked to him, and I don't know how I said this, and he didn't get mad at me, I said to him, you don't have enough time to figure this out. You're going to have to trust that what I'm telling you is the truth. So I told him that Jesus died. Everybody is a sinner. And that Jesus died just to pay the price for sinners. And that if you would accept that, he will save you from your sins. the only way to get to heaven. He asked me how he could do that. I prayed with him. And he trusted in Christ. And 30 days later, he died. Hmm. He's just... He's just one. Uh, he's just one person, but he is one. Um, a young girl that I had a chance to share Christ with um, several years ago um, drifted away from God. Um, in talking to her later, she was sure that she became a Christian like me. I, I said to her when I was talking, I, I, I trusted Christ when I was nine. I had a period of time when I wasn't doing what I should be doing, and at some point I did ask God, did I? Did I really know what I was doing when I trusted Christ at nine, or, or do I need to start from the very beginning? And I'm confident that what I did at nine is when I really trusted Him. It would have been really embarrassing during some of my teenage years um, to have made it to heaven because um, I'll, uh, because I was not living the life what I should. But when I talked to her, um, I, I didn't see her for a number of years. I met up with her again when she was in jail and spent um, two years um, talking with her. I didn't really know this at the time, but in looking back, I realized what took place the next two years was discipleship. And we talked about scripture and Bible stories. I'd go in on uh, lots of Monday mornings and we'd talk about whatever my Sunday school lesson was about the day before. We worked on scripture verses. Today, she is still in prison, but she is pointing other um, people that she is in jail with, in prison with, um, to Christ. And she's leading among them. She's just one. But she is one. Um, Anthony um, sat in this room with me, back in the back corner, um, just a couple months ago, um, was going through a really difficult time, a really low point um, in his life. And as we talked about the struggles of life, I told him that the only one, he doesn't, I don't have all the answers to everything, but the only one that can bring peace and comfort during a time when you are struggling as bad as you are now um, is Jesus. And he said, how, how, do I, how do I find him? And so I shared with him how to find Jesus. And it wasn't, it wasn't a preachery answer, because Anthony had been in church eating his life. I just told him the Bible says all of us have sinned. And because of that, we're all going to be separated. None of us are going to make it to heaven, except for the fact that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. And because of that, when God looks at me, he doesn't see me sees Jesus. He sees me as though I was perfect. And he said, how do I get that? And so he prayed with me. And, and he's just he's just one. Um, but he is one. You, you've got people that are in your life. Um, some of them are ones that you um, some are ones that you, you know don't have any kind of relationship with Christ. Some of them may live next door to you. Some of them may be related to you. Some of them may not. Some of them may be people that you're really frustrated with. Um, they're just one. But you ought to have one. So for several weeks I've been asking you, who, who is your one going to be? There are 39 weeks from now to the end of the year. So here's what I want you to do just as the invitation to I, I, I thought about what I might have you do. I'm not going to have you come to the front. I'm not going to have you stand up. Because if I have you stand up, then, then you have to stand up if the people beside you stand up. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you just today, in the quietness of where you are, would you make a commitment? And if you will, this is between you and God. Would you make a commitment in the next 39 weeks, between now and the end of the year, would you try to find a time when you could invite one person? Um, you can invite them to church, but would you invite them to your house to eat dinner? Would you invite them to go out to eat? Would you do something to build a relationship with them? And you may not get to talk to them. Listen, when I, when I talk with my police officers, it sometimes takes me many times of being around them before they will talk enough to me that I can say something to them about Jesus. Because I, I promise them if they will let me build a relationship with them that I will preach to them. And then I just wait. It is amazing. It is like the lady in the restaurant who said, what time do your services start? 
I don't know, I don't know where she heard anything we were talking about, but people, people ask me, the police officers ask me regularly, how do you know when you're good enough to make it to heaven? That's as big an opening as I need to tell them, can be good enough. I'm not good enough. You may be better than me, probably are better than me, but it doesn't make any difference because you're not good enough and neither am I. Um, would you in the next 39 weeks, would you try to invite one person to begin a relationship, and it may take more than one time before you can get to a place, and I'm telling you, if you will listen, and you won't have to listen real hard, if you will listen, they will come awful close to saying, can you tell me about Jesus? It, it'll sound different. It may be, how do you know when you're good enough? It may be that you will have to ask them at some point, you got any kind of spiritual beliefs? And then, don't put them down for any of them. They're their beliefs. And if they're absolutely, terribly wrong, it's not really okay, but it is their beliefs. Um, do enough of life with them that they would come to a place that they would want whatever it is that you've got. So that's going to be the, the commitment that I ask you to make. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, then the challenge to you is not to invite one. Well, it is to invite one. <laughs> it's, a, it's to invite the one who really can make a difference in your life. Um, and so, so today, as Don comes and leads us, um, in just a moment as we sing, if you don't know who he is, would you just say to God today, um, I do believe I'm a sinner. And I do believe that you died on a cross to pay the price for my sins and it's a free gift and I want to receive it today. And if you are a believer today during this time, would you make a commitment next Sunday? Next Sunday I'm going to give you an opportunity to give me um, a name. And I will tell you now, it's not going to be posted anywhere. It's not going to be up if they ever come to church. Listen, your goal is not to have somebody that you can mark off that you invited. The goal is that you care enough about people that you would want them. The goal is that they're dehydrated and you would give them some water. I mean, that's, that's what the goal is. And so if the way that happens is by inviting them to church, that'd be great. If the way that happens is by inviting them to dinner at your house so you can ask them, do you have any spiritual beliefs? then do that. So next week I'm going to ask you for a name and the only reason I'm asking you is because I'm going to have some people that will gather together and pray every week over the names of whoever it is. You don't have to tell me your name. Just tell me who it is that you're praying for. I've got two or three names that I will put on because I'd really like for you to be praying for some of the folks that I'm, I'm praying for. Let me lead us in prayer. Father God, I thank you for